In Sacred Scripture, Sacred Wars, first chapter, The Curse of Cowardice, James Byrd looks at the use of sermons to build and bolster courage and maintain morale among the American combatants. On the first page of the chapter, he makes the observation that the clergy's task is to build martial courage by generally showing common values, a common social identity, while at the same time replacing typical fears with the fear of being branded a coward. This may be effective, but it reaches only the baser emotion of pride. The advantage in this is anyone not affected by pride would be susceptible to other elements such as valor or heroism. By 1776, more sermons were being preached than any other preceding year in New England's history. As religious rhetoric built up, its effects could be seen in the actions of the colonial soldiers. This anecdote comes from page 17 of the book. In September 1775, five months into the Revolutionary War and five years after Whitefield's death, this is George Whitefield, the famous itinerant preacher of the Awakening, five years after Whitefield's death, a group of colonial army officers visited Whitefield's tomb in Newburyport, Massachusetts. They were looking for inspiration for battle, but in an unusual way. They asked that Whitefield's coffin be opened. When the sexton complied, the officers removed the famous evangelist's collar and wristbands and took the relics with them. In the modern Western Protestant context, this may seem pretty weird. To a well-traveled or well-studied Catholic, it may seem less so, but this is not at all an uncommon idea. Soldiers have been taking relics into battle for millennia, from finger bones of saints to skulls to sacred objects. Biblically, Joshua took the Ark of the Covenant and carried it to Jericho. This begins to hint at the level of fervor and the belief that their cause was a just and righteous cause. There's no doubt that a rousing sermon can get a crowd whipped up and the expectation of regular, similar stirring sermons would increase the number of attendants in the pews. With Christian zeal promoting virtue and righteousness and self-sacrifice for God and country, patriotism was riding a high throughout the colonies. The clergy saw their task as keeping the people, soldiers and civilians alike, on track, focused on their patriotic virtues and displacing the unpatriotic things like revenge, ambition, the lust for money. And while pride is on this list as well, as previously mentioned for some, the tactical use of pride against cowardice seemed to be acceptable. So, preaching these sermons of patriotism not only were supportive to the Americans, they were also a critical function and important to the success of the Revolutionary War. Judah Chapman was a congregational pastor from Lickfield, Connecticut. He had proclaimed that liberty, both civil and religious, often required war, and that virtue always required sacrifice. Chapman knew that both historical and religious contexts were important in building powerful imagery of righteousness, courage, valor, and sacrifice, and he was very talented in using them. He used colonial history and the people's ancestors to build a common imagery. The struggles and the sacrifices, settling in the new world, braving all their hardships that befell them. Mixing colonial and biblical history to build a strong connection with their ancestors, their virtues, the virtues of his congregants, and those of biblical characters. Building a righteous foundation of patriotism and American nationalism. The point of the book, Sacred Scripture, Sacred War, is to describe the strong links between religion, patriotism, particularly in the context of the Revolutionary War, and the book does this very well. Outside of the Revolutionary War context, if viewed from a dispassionate perspective, it also describes a general progression towards war. In state or non-state conflict, each side begins preparing its people by providing the same or very similar rhetorical pattern 
of building a religio-political or socio-political context using historic imagery to create an example of courage, valor, and sacrifice, showing that their position is the righteous one, and the enemy as not having that righteous position. We can see these same steps being played out in the news today between Russia and Ukraine. Without going into the political weeds, both sides are encouraging their combatants with their righteousness of their side, and their valor, courage, sacrifice tied to their history, and that it will lead them to their victory. The religious element is more difficult to see in the current conflict, but the pattern is still there. Looking back at earlier conflicts like the end of the Cold War in the 1980s, the religious element was much more present, particularly on the U.S. side. Not so much on the Soviet side, because religion was not an approved topic, but the socio-political element of it took that place. While our topic for this class is a revolutionary war, and my chosen book is Sacred Scripture, Sacred War, Chapter 1, the relevance of religion in conflict is extremely important because of how inextricably intertwined religion and conflict are. Subtleties will change from conflict to conflict, but the root connection is always present. Even in situations where socio-political seems to take over for religio-political, in many cases, such as the Soviets, that socio-political could be seen as a religious element. Thank you for watching this presentation.